All right, we will call to order the October 17th, 2019 Murray City Planning Commission meeting. I want to welcome all of you in attendance and uh, for those viewing, viewing on the uh, Murray City streaming video feed. Uh, I would introduce our commissioners from your right, uh, Scott Woodbury, uh, Lisa Milkevich, Phil Markham, myself, Ned Hacker, and Sue Wilson, and excused tonight are Travis Ney and Marin Patterson. <clears throat> and the staff with us tonight, Melinda Greenwood, disappeared. She'll be back. She'll be back. Uh, Jared Hall, Zachary Smallwood, and Brian Smartsworth uh, on the side in the back. Thank you. So a few uh, housekeeping things I would like to present to you tonight. Uh, ask that uh, please be respectful of those sitting with you. And as I am doing, please uh, quiet your electronic devices and, and let those here participate without that interruption. If you do get a call or have a sidebar conversation, I'd ask that you take that into the hallway and respect the other people in attendance and uh, we'll provide public comment for our agenda items. If you have comment, I would ask that you limit your comments to three minutes as an individual. If you represent a group to limit your comments to five minutes and if you have uh, the same comment that was just given, I would ask that you um, not particularly come up and say the same thing that somebody else has just said. So um, with that, we'll move on to our first agenda item, which is approval of the minutes from our Murray City Planning Commission meeting held October 3rd. And ask the commissioners if you have had an opportunity to read those and if you have any changes or it entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from the Thursday, October 3rd, 2019 Planning Commission meeting. All right, I have a motion, is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Uh, second item is conflict of interest. I'd ask commissioners if anyone has conflict of interest for any items on the agenda this evening. No. 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 And third item is approval of findings of fact from our previous meeting. Uh, we have three findings of fact, and um, there are no corrections to those. I'd entertain a motion as well. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve the findings of fact for the Lenore Knighton conditional use permit for an accessory dwelling unit, for, the, for Dana Williams a conditional use permit for hidden treasures, and for Eric Wallen, a conditional use permit for Fight City. All right, I have a and motion. Also, I have one more, I'm sorry. Uh, we, do, we did have four. Well, that's right. uh, Sebastian Moncada, Arias, uh, conditional use permit for Lake City Motors, LLC. I'll right. second. The motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion passes. And we'll move to our fourth agenda item, which is Ron Court Accessory Dwelling Unit requesting approval of a conditional use permit to allow an accessory dwelling unit to be located at the property address 618 East, 5900 South, and is applicant here this evening for that. All right, we'll have you come up in a little bit. And Zachary Smallwood is going to give a staff report. Great, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, this is an application for a, an accessory dwelling unit. Um, the address is uh, 618 East, 5900 South, um, as you can see here on the map um, in front of you. Um, um, it is in an R18 zone. Uh, accessory <coughs> dwelling units are allowed um, in all of our single family residential zones subject to a conditional use permit. Um, and uh, I change things around this time, and I because I always just fly through the property pictures. So I'll bring, I'll show them this time. Uh, this is the front of the property, um, fronting on 5900 South. Um, this is the rear area, um, where you can see there is um, an additional driveway. So there was a driveway um, here that leads to a garage, and then there's one that faces um, 620 East um, that leads to the backyard. Um, 
that'll become um, important in a moment. Um, so this is a 2,700 approximately square foot house, um, and they're proposing for a 461 um, square foot uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, we allow accessory dwelling units to go up to um, 1,000 square feet or 20% or I'm sorry, 40% of the home, whichever is less. Um, the, the two numbers I gave you, 461 and 278, amounts to roughly about 17%. So they're well under that 40% total um, that they're allowed to do. Um, the, you access the property from the rear um, as is part of the um, requirements. And so the, these photos get a little um, confusing, so bear with me for a moment. This is the main floor. Um, as you can see, there are stairs um, here that lead downstairs to the basement. Um, then when we go to the basement, then it kind of flips. So this is where they come downstairs. So it's like the house just kind of flipped upside down a little bit. Um, so the this is now the rear of the house. Here's the entrance to the ADU that has the living room, kitchen, bedroom, and a bathroom. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so we are recommending approval with that. There are a few things I do like to mention when it comes to accessory dwelling units. Um, one is that we do not allow short-term rentals in the city of Murray. Um, so we specifically put a condition on there that there are no Airbnbs or VRBOs, those kinds of things allowed um, in the accessory dwelling unit, as well as um, we uh, promote these accessory dwelling units as, as, as an approach to um, housing sort shortage in, in the valley. And um, as part of that, we don't want to see absentee landlords. Um, so we uh, condition that the property owner must live in one of the units. They can live in the ADU or they can live in the main dwelling, um, but they must live on property. So um, those are laid out in the conditions uh, below. Um, other than that, uh, we are recommending approval. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? Straightforward. Questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll have the requester come forward and state your name and your address for the record. Yes, please, to the podium. Just state your record or state your name and your address for the record. My name is Ron Court, uh, 618 East, 5900 South. And you have you had an opportunity to review these conditions for approval? Yes. And are you able to comply with them? Yes, we're in the process of doing that, yeah. And do you have anything to add to the staff report? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's pretty complete. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I will open this agenda item up for public comment. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to comment on this agenda item, please come forward to the podium and we'll listen to you. Yes. I actually did forget to state, um, I mentioned it in the um, pre-meeting, but I wanted to make sure that it was here in the public record as well. Um, I did get about four or five calls um, from residents who had opposed um, opposed the accessory dwelling unit. Um, a lot of the complaints were about um, potential Airbnbs and um, potential absentee landlords as well. Um, and I, I addressed those items with them and just I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that and make sure that it's in the public record as well. All right, thank you. Any public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment and bring it back to the commissioners for discussion or a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve a conditional use permit to allow an accessory dwelling unit at the property address 618 East 5900 South subject to conditions one through 13. All right, a mm -hmm. motion, is there a second? Mr. Chair, can I second that motion? I have a second. Any other discussion? Jared, could you do a roll call vote, please? Mr. Woodbury? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Yes. All right, so motion passes. Congratulations. Good luck with your ADU project. We will move to agenda item number five which is Envision Cosmetic Surgery requesting approval for a conditional use permit to allow a pole sign with an electric, 
electronic message center to be installed at the property located at 5417 South Commerce Drive. And is the applicant here for that? All right, good. We'll have you come up in a little bit. And Zachary Smallwood will give us staff report. Great, thanks again. Um, so like you had stated, this is for an electronic message center, which in layman's terms mean, layman's terms mean it, an LED, LCD, um, a, a sign of that type, um, where you actually have flashing, at, not flashing, but scrolling messages throughout that. Um, so it is located, um, they're proposing for the location off 53rd. This is I-15 along here, 53rd, and then Commerce Drive. Um, there is been approved and is under construction for Envision Cosmetic Surgery. Um, it's a cosmetic surgery business as well. They're, they're building a two-story office building there. Um, it is in the CD zone, and in our sign code, electronic message centers um, do require a conditional use permit. Um, therefore it's before you guys um, here are a couple photos of the site um, like I mentioned it, it is under construction they have the footings being um, installed right now um, a, lo it's a lot of construction going on right there um, the signs gonna go pretty close to this this light pole here um, which is actually one of the conditions or um, that was mentioned in your staff report uh, the power company um, was concerned with the distance there. So they'll have to work on uh, um, making sure that they stay out of that. Um, it's located in this red area here. Um, it does meet all the setbacks, which is um, 15 feet from <coughs> the, it's a 15, tri 15 foot triangular um, from the entrance of the uh, of the driveway to make sure that there's no um, visual impacts there. Other than that, it's a 200 square, uh, 200 square foot sign. Um, and that is allowed with, uh, the subject to the conditional use permit. Um, couple pictures of the sign. Um, they can go up to the 35 feet, which they are proposing. This kind of lays out how you do the measurements on, on the sign. So the 200 square feet is for um, the total. So it's 142 square feet for the actual LED sign. And then it's 57.3 uh, approximately. So it, it measures out. So we are recommending approval for this sign um, subject to the 11 conditions in front of you. Um, any questions I can answer on this one? Zach, I've got a couple of questions for sure. you. Um, now, this sign will only be able to advertise for this business, correct? It that will is, not be a general advertisement sign? Um, as of right now, that is correct. Um, it is for this business. Um, I, I am not aware of um, any off-site signage that might be coming before you. Might. Okay. So as of right now, yes, it has to be for that business. And just uh, how, how much of, of what we have at our disposal to regulate these types of signs is is unique to Murray as opposed to what is required by the state um, as far as signage. Aren't, aren't a lot of the regulations dealing with signage like this, um, doesn't that come down from the state legislature? A lot of it does. Um, a lot of it actually, um, if you'll recall, um, and I can't remember the case off the top of my head. Yeah, Gilbert V. Reed, thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Um, so that case is what really changed signage. Um, it kind of flipped it on its head. Um, and that's kind of what, uh, that was, is actually a federal case. Um, and that's what's required us to change how we do things. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions for staff? All right, thank you. Thank you. Would the applicant please come forward and state your name and your address for the record, please? I am uh, Justin Grubb with Yesco at 1605 South Gramercy Road, Salt Lake City, Utah. All right. And have you had an opportunity to review these 11 conditions for approval? Yes. And are you be. able to comply with them? Yes. No problems. And do you have anything to add to our staff report? Um, no. I think it was pretty complete. Um, to answer 
Uh, Phil's question, though, the sign is fully intended to only be for on-premise ad advertising. As far as I know, I don't think they're even planning on having any uh, another additional tenant in their building. It's only going to be fully solely for them. So there shouldn't be any issues with that, hopefully. Thank right. you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I will open this agenda item up for public comment. Anyone like to comment on this agenda item? Seeing none, I will close public comment and ask commissioners for any ad additional discussion or a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Commission approve a conditional use permit to allow an electronic <coughs> message sign at the property addressed 5417 South Commerce Drive, subject to conditions 1 through 11 as presented to us. I'll second. second. Oh, you got it, Sue. Okay. Right. I'll second. I have motion and a second. Is there any additional Sue. discussion? All right. Jared? Mr. Markham? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Yes. Mr. Woodbury? Yes. Yes. All right. So motion passes, and good luck with your sign and your business. All right. Uh, the agenda has postponed uh, item number six until our 7 November meeting. So we will move to item number seven, land use ordinance text amendment, requesting amendment to the Murray City land use ordinance regarding uh, accessory structure height in residential zoning districts as it applies to chapter 17 and numerous sections of chapter 17. Right. So this, this actually, I'll leave this on this title slide for just a second so we can talk about that. <coughs> this is uh, an amendment that we're proposing as staff to, to the rules regarding rear yard accessory structures and, and accessory structures in all of these different residential zones. And there are a host of them. The rule is pretty much the same for all of them. And that is, in essence, that uh, height, and this isn't exactly worded correctly for all of them, but I didn't want to list it 16 times for you, so I just am broadly showing it here. That rule is essentially that for an accessory structure in a rear yard, the height, or for any, we only allow them inside in rear yards anyway, so for accessory structures, the height is limited to either 20 feet, and we measure to the peak of the roof, the top, the highest point, or the height of the house, whichever is less. Uh, in many cases, that's fine. Most homes are 20 feet or 25 feet or even 30 feet and beyond. However, there are some homes that are shorter than that, and they, if they're constructing, you know, stick-built new construction, they can make that work. If they're a 13 foot tall home or a 12 foot tall home with a slow, a low pitch or a no pitch. Um, but many of the kits that people buy for sheds, a shed you can buy from Costco, for example, and put in the backyard is going to have a 14, 15, or 16 foot peak on it. And that's come up a lot in the last year. Um, we, we felt like it was finally time this after enduring a summer of telling people they can't have that uh, fairly normal shed that we should address this. So, what we're proposing is that instead, you can have the 20 foot height for an accessory structure as long as your home is 20 feet or greater. And if you're less than 20 feet, if your home is less than 20 feet, you can still have 16 feet in height. That means that while we'll allow greater height for that rear yard accessory building and it might be taller than the home, it's not going to be more than four or five feet taller than the home. So the visual impact won't be jarring. And that's really what the code was written to prevent anyway. So we feel like it's a good compromise and it will make a lot of people's lives a lot easier. We actually feel like it's been a long time coming. We just hadn't pulled the trigger on it. Do you have any questions for staff? That would apply to all of these zones throughout as we kind of listed them here. So, Any questions for staff? No. No, I, I would just like to say that this is a welcome change. Um, there are some, some areas that were some rather large neighborhoods developed in the, the late 50s, early 60s that did not include garages with them yeah. and in today's market that that greatly enhances the uh yeah. the value of a home and if people can add those garages to uh these structures and make them look like they belong right. I, I think it's a wonderful thing great thank you all right thank you all right i will open this item for public comment anyone like to comment on this agenda item Seeing none, I will close it and bring it back to the commissioners for any additional discussion or a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we forward a recommendation of approval to the City Council for the proposed text amendment to, amendment to multiple chapters of the Murray City Land Use Ordinance regarding accessory structure height in residential zoning districts. 
All right, you have a motion. Mr. Chair, can I second the motion? And a second. Uh, is there any additional discussion? All right, Jared, would you call a roll call vote? Mr. Woodbury. Yes. David. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Hacker. Yes. All right, so the motion passes and a recommendation will be forwarded to the Murray City Council for their consideration. Agenda item number eight is land use ordinance text amendment requesting amendments to the Murray City land use ordinance for the Murray City Center District MCC, MCCD zone as it applies to chapter 17.170. And I think Linda's going to give us a uh, lead in, and Jared's going to give us staff report. I'll turn my microphone on. Thank you. I wanted to just give a little bit of background on the process that we have gone through as we've arrived at what's before you this evening. This is something that we started working on really back in March and went through a process meeting with the city council, um, sending out a survey with them um, or to them, looking at those results, having a workshop meeting with them and really just kind of taking a, a, a hard long look at the ordinance we have in place, some of the I guess projects that have come to fruition, some of those that haven't over the course of the last, let's just say 40 years since we've had uh, the, the, the zoning here in this downtown area. Initially there was an ordinance put in place called the DHOD um, in 2003, I believe it was, we, 2005 we put the MCCD in. Um, so we've had a good 15 years or so under this ordinance and the consensus really has been that there were several elements of the ordinance that were really a deterrent to development. And we have worked towards removing those deterrents. Um, so we have worked closely with the mayor's office as we've gone through the process of revising this ordinance. We've also worked with the attorney's office. Um, we believe that we've taken a lot of input into consideration. We've spoken with developers. We've also spoken with several of the property owners that, oh, that own property in the MCCD area. And even we've taken some public comments um, through some of the process that been through the RDA and some of the concepts and proposals that have been presented to them over the course of the last, last few months. So the the general sentiment was that what we wanted to do was come forward to the Planning Commission and the City Council with a kinder, gentler approach and one that would fully restore private property rights. Um, so the main purpose as we look at what we've done here is really to just remove development barriers and to encourage development. We're wanting to simplify and streamline the process that has, has been put in place so that it is one that is easier to understand, one that is a quicker process to go through and we've wanted to re to deregulate and restore the private property rights. Um, essentially what we're looking at is instead of instead of disincentivizing, we're wanting to approach with incentivizing groups to come in and develop or to preserve historic buildings. Um, we're removing some of the uncommon provisions that's been in the ordinance, um, some things that just aren't very typically found in a lot of other places. And we are also moving towards creating the MCCD zone to be more of a true mixed use zone. So some of the changes we are recommending are actually mirroring the changes we've just come forward with the mixed use zone that the Planning Commission approved or sent a recommendation of approval to the City Council in July, I believe it was, and then the City Council passed that, I believe, the very beginning of September. Um, so one of the main things that I would like the Planning Commission and also the audience to know is that this hasn't been, been done without a lot of 
internal discussion and conversations. Um, we took the draft of this ordinance back to, um, well, not back to, but we met individually with city council members last week, and I believe that what we have before you is something that will be well supported when it does go forward to the city council. Um, I do want to mention that in recent conversations over the last couple of days, there are a couple council members who have some concerns that may end up being addressed when it comes to them at the city council meeting. One of those concerns was about parking, and another council member had a concern regarding the sustainability portion of the ordinance. Um, but again, what we have before you this evening is something that has been well vetted internally. We do feel like we've taken into consideration a lot of um, comment <coughs> from stakeholders and um, and just essentially what we're really doing here is is restoring private property property rights, especially when we're talking about the historic preservation portion. So we really wanted to be mindful of those who own property in the MCCD and those who, who have had restrictions placed on their property over the years. And some of the outcomes of those restrictions and some of the projects that have come through have been very detrimental in the eyes of those property owners. And so we're listening to them. We are, we are deregulating and we're restoring those property rights to them through what we're proposing with the historic preservation portion. And Jared will go through a little bit more detail later on with that. But um, just again, wanting to know that I feel like what we have before you is something that has been well vetted politically. Um, it's really coming from the mayor's office and we do, I think, have the support of the city council members on the majority of what we're gonna be discussing this evening. Right. Thank you. So Jared Hall will give us staff report. All right. Um, thank you. And I appreciate the intro, Melinda. Thank you. Um, so as Melinda said, this is uh, all of these changes are regarding the Murray City Center District Zone. It's just about 100 acres, just under 100 acres in the middle of town, uh, encompassing the downtown. And uh, as you can see, east and west of State Street, north and south, uh, Vine Street and 4800 South kind of form the boundaries in general. Um, all of the things that we'll talk about tonight, it's important to understand are specific to this zone. They don't, they don't bleed over into TOD zoning or any other zones at all. Um, one of the first changes we made uh, or were proposing to make was to the purpose statement. We significantly shortened that. Most of the purpose statements in our code are significantly shorter. We kept most of those tenants and took language from the 2017 general plan regarding the city center designation, land use designation, which corresponds to this zone. Uh, so you'll see that in there. Um, and that, again, that the 2017 general plan, just looking at the bottom here, the last statement there, the 2017 Murray City general plan suggests that the city center should include development which is pedestrian oriented with a strong emphasis on the urban design and streetscape. Uh, those elements are still going to be the dominant elements in this plan, even with the proposed changes that we've uh, brought tonight. Um, one of the big changes is to process that we're recommending. Um, major alterations in the current MCCD zone, major alterations and new construction require the Planning Commission's approval. Um, major alterations are a number of different things. They don't include things like adding an awning, a, a sign, uh, changing a doorway, something like that. Those are minor alterations, and even those have to have, to have a staff review uh, for a design review approval. We call them certificates of appropriateness under the current code. Uh, but anything bigger than that has to come to the Planning Commission. That remains the same. We still want, in this, in this small downtown area, in this 100 acres, we want there to be a public process for all of those things. We want the Planning Commission weighing in on all of those kinds of designs. Um, we are recommending, however, that we don't refer to them as certificates of appropriateness anymore. Uh, we would prefer the term design review approval. It's more appropriate to the land use forum that it's happening in as, a, as opposed to the uh, certificate of appropriateness moniker. Um, the design review committee also. Uh, we are recommending in this draft that the design review committee that has functioned uh, for a number of years while the MCCD has been in place uh, be disbanded and removed. Uh, that layer of review, staff prepares reports for the design review committee, presents them to the design review committee, uh, receives comments, and then forwards those comments along with a revised staff report to the Planning Commission. It can add um, some significant time to the process of approval, and we have recommended removing that, that step in the process. Um, 
related to that, the design guidelines. The MCCD, different than other zones, doesn't only have regulations contained in the code, it also has a set of design guidelines that are related to it. We have um, proposed language referring to those design guidelines in this way, uh, it's slightly different. Um, the design gui the guidelines shall be consulted during the review of proposed development in order to provide guidance, direction, and options which will further the stated purposes of the MCCD. Wherever practicable, development should adhere to the objectives and principles contained in the design guidelines. Um, we're also recommending that those design guidelines we have in place, they'll remain in place right now. Uh, but we do want to start working to adjust those to change them and make them less will make them more relevant to the current uh, current trends in architecture and design and urban streetscape, et cetera, and easier to understand and utilize so that they become more a part, an intrinsic part of all the things that we do and all the designs that we review. For example, uh, we'd like to reduce them to one-page principles that are clearer, easier to understand for developers and for staff to, to apply to the different projects that come before the Planning Commission or that would come before the Planning Commission. So each design review guideline would actually be a principle that would have supporting kinds of goals and, and things that we could use. Uh, and it would be clear about the issue that's being addressed and why that's important and give us recommendations. This is just a sample. We don't have any that we've generated ourselves yet. That'll be our next project uh, if this is the kind of proposal that gets approved. Uh, another example of one that works well, and this one kind of maybe illustrates it better, it's a clear single page design and the, the purpose that it's trying to accomplish or the principle is modulated horizontal modul or sorry, vertical modulation for the building. So what that's expressing right here are the different bandings and things that happen. So it's clearer for a design review team. If we give them a page like this and say your building is going to be subject to this kind of principle, it's easier for that design review team, that architecture team to take that back to their client and say these are the kinds of things the city is looking for in the design. Right now that's difficult in our current design review um, guidelines. They're very complicated and, and contain a lot of very specific items. We want to move from that to broader principles that we would want applied to the project. Um, that's another change. Historic preservation, and this is, Melinda touched on this and we'll, we'll further it a little bit here. Right now the, the code, uh, the MCCD as it reads is very, the language is very deterrent oriented, disincentivization of removal of structures that have been identified as historically significant. Um, for example, this is just a, a small excerpt from a little portion of the requirements for removal of demolition of a historic building. If demolition is approved, the applicant or property owner must be willing to provide a performance security and financial guarantee equal to 125 percent of the estimated cost of the project. Even on a small project, that is a significant burden for a developer and has been a huge deterrent for any kind of development or redevelopment of buildings. Um, we would rather see historic preservation supported um, through an incentive. Uh, we don't have huge incentives to provide right now as a city. We looked into that and what we felt like we could offer and propose would be that the city would waive building permit fees and other fees that can add up to make significant uh, amounts and maybe help a project that was contemplating renovation of a single building or a couple of buildings or even facade restoration if it could help them do that and, and make these buildings better and maybe keep them. Uh, for example, application and permit fees for projects involving the renovation of historically significant buildings will be waived. Historically significant is the operative term. So right now in the MCCD zone, there is a list of historically identified historically significant buildings. And the other part of the change that we're recommending here is not that that list go away. We, we think that list ought to stay, but it should not be in code. It should be removed from code so that people can remove themselves, property owners, as Melinda pointed out, in the restoration of property rights, so that property, right, property owners could petition the community development department, the mayor's office, directly to remove themselves from that list if they cannot uh, make these things happen, if that incentive doesn't work for them. Um, for that reason, the list would still remain. Those identified buildings would still be identified, but uh, we would take that out of code. You'll see that in your, in your red lines. Um, as a, just as a clarifier, we want to be, we want to be sure to, to make this point. Um, we feel like historic preservation and staff feels like and the city feels like in general too as we've talked about these things with other groups. Historic preservation is a very important part of Murray's downtown and, and of Murray's history. Uh, to that end, the city has over the years put a lot into some historic preservation efforts. On this um, page, there's a couple of pictures I just wanted to point out. The city currently owns the Murray Mansion and is preparing to spend a significant amount of money to renovate that and, and reuse it uh, in the city halls. Uh, plans to expand City Hall, this building remains. 
Um, and that's not, a, not an insignificant expense to the city. We've invested in that property to be sure that it remains part of Murray's landscape going forward. The Murray Theater as well, I think there were some recent uh, Murray Journal articles about the proposed, the Parks and Rec Department proposal to renovate that building. It'll be a spectacular building. We want to see that kept and, and remain a part of Murray's landscape. In the past, there were grants for uh, building restoration and facade restoration given to the property where the Desert Star resides and also Daymarie Music and uh, several other smaller projects um, that happened as well that were given grants to, to restore facades and to renovate the buildings. And we don't have that kind of money anymore to provide an incentive. What we do feel like we can provide is the waiving of building permit fees. That's not an insignificant amount. It can be on a small project. It might not be more than several thousand dollars, but on a large project, it's tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Um, so we feel like that's a good incentive. Um, another change that we're proposing is to the area and frontage regulations. Um, this is this is not a, a huge change, but it is it is small, and it's an opportunity for me and staff and to present to you as planning commission to make sure we all understand how this works. The setbacks for buildings in the MCCD zone, like the mixed use zone, are different. We measure them from the back of the curb, and that's in an attempt to pull buildings out to the street and create that sort of street frontage and activity that we want to see. In the MCCD, we're proposing this. Building facades need to occupy at least 50% of the property frontage on the streets, with maximum allowed setbacks between 12 and 18 feet from the back of the curb and gutter. What that really means is zero to five feet from the property line. And there's a, in the next slide, I can point that out better for you. but. If those setbacks are greater, if you're proposing more than a zero or five foot setback for your building, so if your building's not going to be right up on the sidewalk, a little further back, then 80% of it needs to be within that 13 feet of the property line, which is about 25 feet from the back of the curb and gutter. Municipal buildings, um, public buildings, quasi-public quasi buildings, um, we've proposed to, they, actually it's already been passed and so we've left that alone in the ordinance. They can be considered for greater setbacks currently um, if they're using that setback for public plazas, parks, and other purposes. So this is a, um, a graphic that Zach prepared for our, our team um, that illustrates this point. So I'll just show you here um, those setbacks we were just talking about. So here's the back of the curb and gutter. So we measure back a minimum of 12 feet. That's zero property line. That's a seven foot sidewalk and five feet for additional space that's either tree wells and, and trees or landscaping as it's shown on the other side uh, in this other graphic here. But that's basically the end of the right of way. Okay, that's the back side of the sidewalk. Now that might look seamless if you're looking at a, uh, an actual street frontage. Um, you won't necessarily see differences in that, in that sidewalk, or it'll look like a wider sidewalk than seven feet, but it'll actually be, no matter what, seven feet of clear sidewalk. And then you can start your building envelope right here. That's a zero setback. That additional right there is to five feet. And then you can go as far back as 13, but 80% of your building frontage needs to be up at that line if you're gonna be at 13 feet back from the property line. So this line right here is 13 feet back from property and 25 from the curb and gutter. Does that make sense? Okay. So what that means in, in real time in pictures is this. Most buildings, if 50% of this building, at least 50% of a building like this needs to be up against the street. So there might be a parking lot back here. They could perhaps, but this is within zero to five feet of that property line. Over here, you can see a street in the back. It's not the greatest picture, but right here is a street, and then you can see across the street there. They've increased their setback in this area, and we could allow that kind of thing for a purpose, outdoor dining, um, pedestrian space, something like that. But in this case, 80% of this building frontage, of this property frontage, needs to be occupied by that building because they proposed a greater setback. Related to that are public improvements. Um, and we touched on them just briefly, so I'll, I'll be real quick here, but in the MCCD zone, we require a larger setback for sidewalks than we do in the other zones. This is, this is a 12-foot setback. We have 15 in the MCC, in the, sorry, in the mixed use. Here we have 12, seven and five, because some of the, con we have some properties that are already out toward the street. So when they initially put this zone in place, they, they identified that it would be uh, attainable to get 12 feet of public setback. So you have five feet for a park strip or tree wells or a, a, some sort of furnishing zone and then seven feet clear for sidewalk, and then you begin your building setbacks. And then they can be a little bit greater, so we have room for transition to get ADA compliance, uh, loading and offloading into cars where we have public parking on the street, et cetera. Uh, this is just a shot in front of Daymarie Music where you can see some of this, although it's a little bit narrower than that 12 feet right in front of Day because it's a slightly closer. But you have that clear sidewalk, slightly less than the seven feet we want to see, and a little bigger in the furnishing zones here, uh, but this would be that five foot area for furnishings, benches, et cetera. One of the other things about um, 
about that furnishing is these are standard issue kind of things we want to see all throughout uh, the public parts of the MCCD zone. So all of the benches and tree grates and garbage cans will look the same. Uh, we've kept that in the ordinance, but we are allowing individual properties on property with their site improvements to propose different, um, different light fixtures, different benches, et cetera, as long as they're coordinated for their site and they're off the public improvements. So the street frontages will all look the same and have that continuity. Building scaling and density, this is the same as the mixed use that we recently talked about. Ground floor commercial has been a huge impediment for development and redevelopment as well as the historic preservation. Um, those are kind of the twin, the twin problems we first identified. But the ground floor commercial right now, the requirements are that the entire ground floor of any building that um, has to be commercial. You can't do residential on the ground floors at all. That's a difficult thing for some properties that are deep, as we discussed with the mixed use ordinance recently. So we're proposing the same thing here, that where those buildings are adjacent to public streets, they need to have a 40 foot depth of commercial on the ground floor, no residential in that area. Unlike the mixed use zone, which is 75% of that ground floor being commercial, this is 100% of the ground floor commercial for 40 feet back, except for their allowance for a, a lobby to get to the upper rooms or a management office, et cetera, that's already written into the code. We left that alone. Um, additionally, for building scaling and density, other changes that have happened here, you can, you can add parking behind that 40 feet. That's huge. That lets us get more parking. That, that, increases the likelihood that we don't have giant surface parking lots that are visible from the street. They're behind the building or underneath the building, et cetera. Right now, we, we can't really do that, so it, it's difficult. Uh, we also added, um, as we discussed in the pre-meeting, horizontal mixed use, a definition for that, as we've done in the mixed use zone. When buildings, when it's not that there's a ground floor that's commercial and then residential, but rather residential buildings on one part of the property that's being developed as a master plan and commercial buildings on another portion. Those same controls for memorandums of understanding and master site plans have been included in this uh, proposed draft as well. Um, and then again, the, the, lastly, we have, a, we have proposed a, uh, an exception for projects that can demonstrate a security concern. Um, a, a big one would be, for example, the police department building. The police station going in the, mix, in the MCCD zone has issues of evidence and security access and things like that. So some of the rules that we have that generally apply, having multiple entrances 75, every 75 feet and ground floor windows, et cetera, there may be portions of the police department that can't meet that standard. So we've written in um, a possible exception when they can demonstrate that those are security concerns. Another big one, it's not limited just to uh, public facilities, however, because there are other entities that we would want to see locate in the MCCD that would have the same concerns, perhaps. Um, grocery stores spring to mind. Some of those concerns, if they can demonstrate that they're legitimate and we can, we can kind of achieve the same goals with other means, we want to be able to do that. So we've written in an exception there. Height. Um, this is another change that you want to be aware of. Uh, right now, properties east of State Street are not subject to a minimum requirement of 40 feet in height. 40 feet or four stories is a, a minimum requirement for any property in the MCCD zone west of State Street. Uh, east of State Street, it doesn't apply. It doesn't limit them to heights, it just doesn't require them to build at least 40 feet. Um, conversely though, we do have one height requirement from, uh, that measures buildings to residential zone boundaries. So any building in the MCCD zone that's within 150 feet of a residential zone boundary can't be more than 50 feet under the current code. We have proposed lessening that requirement to 100 feet to allow the greater height. And we have a kind of a scaled version of that that I'll show you in, in just a moment here. One thing to point out first, though, is that in, the, in that same zone, in the MCCD zone, the north end of town, I'm sorry, wrong picture, the, right at the north end at 4800 South, there are properties on Center Street. And right now, the code reads that properties in the MCCD zone that are adjacent to Center Street uh, can't be more than 35 feet high if they're, north, if they're north of Court Avenue. So it's this area that I've kind of highlighted. That would stay in place. That was carefully considered and put in place, and, and it makes a lot of sense for that area right there. Uh, with that said, where we do have a concern about the height and the reason that we're proposing a lessening of that 150-foot separation to residential zone boundaries is because of the city-owned property here that will become available if City Hall moves for development and its proximity to RM15 zoning. It's difficult to place a building. Um, if that height difference makes a difference, we want to make sure that we're a little bit flexible there. So what we're proposing is that if you're within 50, or sorry, if you're within 80 feet of a residential zone boundary, not 150, but 80, uh, you can go up to 50, you're limited to 80 feet high, or sorry, 50 feet in for the building height. 
There's a lot of 80s and 50s going on here. It's confusing for a, a non-math person like myself. Uh, then between, eight, if your building is between 80 and 100 feet from that residential zone boundary, you can go up to 75 feet in height. If you're more than 100 feet for your building from that residential zone boundary, then that building is allowed up to the maximum height that we allow currently in the MCCD zone, which is 135 feet or 10 stories. Realistically, in, in modern construction, 135 feet is probably more like eight stories, just to be clear. Um, Zach prepared again a couple of graphics to talk about that. And just before I show you those, to, to kind of illustrate those three sets of numbers that we just talked about, it's important to point out that most, the majority of the MCCD zone is not adjacent to residential zoning. So it's not going to be an issue for most of, most of the properties are going to be allowed that, that 135 feet. Uh, however, there are those, those properties on the north side of 4800 South. And then, um, again, here on the City Hall property and, and adjacent to Vine Street. And along Center Street, again, we're proposing that that stay that 35 feet maximum. Um, so just to show you visually what that means. So if this distance from this building to the residential zone boundary shown here is 80 feet or less, that building is limited to 50 feet in height. So that's what it looks like visually. This is scaled correctly. That's a 25-foot home. That's a 50-foot tall building. The next category is between 80 and 100 feet. So if this building is located somewhere between 80 and 100 feet from that residential zone boundary, it can go up to 75 feet tall. <laughs> that's what it looks like in, in real life. The third category is that maximum allowance. Right now it's 150 feet. We're proposing removing that and, and reducing that to 100. And that gets you to this third level here. So that's, that's the maximum height anywhere in the zone, 135 feet, has to be at least 100 feet from that residential zone boundary. Go ahead, Lisa. So can I ask a quick question just for sure. scale? So in this graphic here, is the, oh, what is the street over here between Ken Price and this property? Jones Court. Jones Court, thank you. Is Jones Court from the front of the, is that There's the, the scale, the about 80 feet? Of, the other side of Jones Court down further south on our property here at City Hall is not actually zoned residentially. The okay. only place it is, is One more slide back, yep, yep right there. See, this is, it's, you've got open space zoning here. This is the corner that matters. So, so, so we have to be 150 feet from that corner to get maximum height. So what is feet. that? 150 feet from that corner, is that just across the street or is that into the property? It, you'd need to be 50 feet from that corner if it's only, and I don't know the distance of the street. That's, yeah. But if you were 50 feet across the street, you'd be limited to 50 feet in height. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a visual. I'm assuming that street's about 20 feet wide. So we're about 30 feet into the property line before you that put- right away is going to be at least 49 feet wide. 49 feet wide. So that first row of whatever's built there could be five, 50 feet. 50 feet. Okay. Further okay. back from that, it could get taller. And the second row would be probably farther, just for a visual on what right. we're talking about. The first row would be about 50 feet, and the second row back would be about 80 feet. That's right. I mean, it's, 75 feet. That rule would open things up a lot for the city hall site. It wouldn't open things up as much for uh, redevelopment here along the corner of Jones and Vine. That's close enough that it would be limited, sorry. That's close enough that it would probably be limited at least to that 50 or 75 feet in height. It wouldn't get any taller than that. And its current restriction is 50 feet in height. So under the current zoning, if you made no changes at all. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so that's the, uh, that final slide shows you how far you got to be away from residential zoning boundaries to get to that 135 feet. And to be clear, this is 100 feet to the boundary, it's actually another, it's gonna be another 125 to the, to the building on the resident, or another 25 feet to the building on that residential lot, more than likely, but there you go. Um, another change that we propose is to parking. It's a smaller change, but I wanted to point it out just because it's, a, it's an important part of this zoning. Parking regulations in the MCCD zone, like other mixed use zones, are lighter than standard commercial parking requirements. We are proposing, however, that they go up slightly. Um, right now, we have current maximum, we have maximum parking allowances as well as minimums. The maximum parking allowed right now for residential zoning is 1.25 spaces for a two bedroom unit or less. It's one to one as a minimum. You have to provide at least one parking space for every dwelling unit in this zone as a minimum. So this is just showing you the current maximums. It's important to note that the minimum is one. The maximum is 1.25, we're proposing that should be 1.5 without any penalties. For more than two bedrooms, it's currently 1.4 as a maximum. We, that should be two uh, as a maximum allowance without any kind of penalties or requirements. Okay. Um, that's still not a heinous requirement for residential 
facilities and, and most of them will probably want to do that anyway but we want to make sure that's allowable go ahead so i can ask you one more question i know sure. it's more appropriate to wait to the end but there's so much here i'm afraid i'll forget i we apologize um item nine we're talking about and maybe we should talk about an item nine but help me remember item nine we're talking about a state bill 34 and how it affects some of our codes and in that bill i believe it refers to moderate income housing and parking yes well this this change is, this is still well under what okay. we normally require for parking for multiple, it's still under it that's why we're saying and this is the maximum again that we allow so it's still underneath it and yeah we'd, we'd still be uh, still in, good. in compliance okay um but good point so you're, you're doing your reading that makes me very happy i'm, I'm trying to follow <laughs> along <laughs> thank you lisa is very thorough yes <laughs> trying um, and then just to point out too, the other proposal or that we aren't proposing any changes to the non-residential requirements right now they're they're pretty light too um, given other standards for for parking one space per 500 net usable square feet of a, of a business an office etc is not a huge requirement uh, two per thousand is about half of, of a lot of requirements uh, we do allow maximums however one space between 265 to 350 that's roughly in the range of three per thousand um, so that's a maximum. Now, anytime you go over the maximum, we'll allow that. The Planning Commission can approve that in a design, but you've got to see that it's within the envelope of a building or it's in a parking structure. The purpose of that is to allow somebody to do extra parking if they really feel like they need it, but not to end up with something like this photo over here. This is Winco in South Salt Lake. Um, they've worked really hard. I started out my career in South Salt Lake as a planner, and they worked really hard to do a lot of great sort of downtown things and got stuck with a giant parking lot in front of the Winco. It was worth it to get the Winco, I suppose, but we don't want to see that. This isn't what you want in your downtown, a giant parking lot. So that's the reason for those, those standards. Um, again, parking, there are several other small changes to um, details in the sustainability standards and in the landscaping standards. I'll just, I should have a couple of slides for those and they didn't make it into this as we were finishing the preparations, I guess. Uh, landscaping standards right now require some we want to keep indigenous species, we want to do xeriscaping, we want to do all of those things. However, right now the standards say that, for example, you have to have 70% of the trees that you plant have to be native species. Um, we're not currently doing that. We have a different list that, was, that we got generated working with the, US, the USU Extension and working with our Parks Department of basically native species, species that have been native for the last 200 years anyway, um, or 150 years or so. We want to keep doing that kind of thing and still provide as much indigenous species as we can, but we don't want the specifics of 70%, 20%, 50% for shrubs, etc. It doesn't work for the landscapers that we've ever worked with in this zone. So we want to encourage native species, but not with specific uh, percentages. Uh, and we want to generate a list um, that is more appropriate uh, for the zone, for the, for the city. Um, again, that's the, the kind of, there are some other changes that's in your, in your red lines. I apologize for not having the slide. Um, we did propose a couple of findings. I just want to read those for the record. The proposed amendments are in keeping with the purpose, goals, and objectives of the Murray City General Plan, and the proposed amendments here will help facilitate quality mixed-use redevelopment of properties in the city center. Um, we are recommending that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of approval to the City Council for these amendments. And with that, I'll close and let you ask any questions you might have. Thank you. Great. Question for Jerry. Uh, not right now. There will be. <laughs> I, had, I had two questions. I'm not sure if I should wait or should I go ahead, go ahead. now. It's up to you, Lisa. Okay. So just one just maybe to help with the conversation later. Later, When we were talking about um, the design review committee and maybe doing away with that committee. Um, I had some concerns about that and we talked about it a little bit and I feel less concerned now and I just want to let the public in on that discussion. Um, I think our discussion was around the committee originally was designed because we felt as a city we need help following the lead recommendations and now instead of using lead our city is using the high performance building standards. Correct. And for, for public buildings only. Okay. So that, that gets to the sustainability question. One of the, in part anyway, some of the things that we still want to do are, are things like <coughs> low impact development practices. We want to use bioswales to treat storm water as opposed to complicated systems wherever we can. And we'll keep encouraging that. And we'll encourage that through. That gets encouraged by LEED. It gets encouraged by high performance building standards. Um, and we'll keep on doing those things. But right now in the code, the only 
buildings that are required to meet high performance building standards are public buildings like the city hall or the fire station, the police station. Um, private buildings wouldn't be required, they'd be encouraged but not required to do that. Um, so some of that, some of that need for expertise uh, is, is dissipated a bit. Uh, again too, I just want to zip back to the front here. Um, our current design guidelines are not as simple and as clear as this. And so it's harder for staff to implement those. It's harder to make sure we're, we're not missing things. And that's part of the reason, again, for that extra layer of review. With that extra or with that simplification, it should be easier to, to make sure we hit all those points and keep a, process, keep a project moving through the process and not hang it up and, and jeopardize it, but still get those main points um, figured out and reported on to the Planning Commission, for example. Right now, staff is making a report to the DRC there are some discussions and there are, it does sometimes generate some changes, but there are times when those projects are very simple and they get hung up for 30 or 45 days in a, in a system for no reason really or, or doesn't amount to value all the time. Which, which why does it take that long, Jared? Why, why can't it be streamlined? Because, you know, those people, I, honestly, I have, that, that's a major concern of mine is the elimination of the, the DRC. DRC. Those people have, um, you know, great credentials. They have vetted the types of materials, the style of the buildings, a lot of things, and, and I've trusted their opinion right. over the last eight years, and I've, I've valued that. And isn't, isn't there a way we can streamline their, their involvement? Just because it's onerous right now doesn't mean that that can't be changed and we can still have their opinions. Right, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take anything away from the DRC. I agree with you, Commissioner, that I've enjoyed working with them. They do great work. And we do get a lot of value it's out reassuring. of it. reassuring. Yeah. And, and if that's the, the feeling of the Planning Commission, I appreciate knowing that. Sometimes we wonder in the process how much of it is, is making sense. Um, there might be a way to streamline it without removing them. Part of the problem of it taking longer is that uh, they only meet once a month. We have had a few times when we were not able to foot a quorum, and we wind up pushing it back even a few but more weeks. Those are administrative rules sure. that can be changed. We could. That's absolutely true. And I think those that kind of streamlining, I, I don't know that there's a, a big need for that to streamline that process in the, the, the greater scheme of what we're looking at and, and what we're charged to do. So sure. if it takes an extra month, maybe we'll get the answer right. Okay. When I first read, I had the same reaction as Phil. I, it's, it feels like we're trying to give a lot of rights back to the, the property owners, which is wonderful, and try to encourage more development, but it seems like we're sacrificing maybe a little transparency, maybe a little bit more review on it. Um, I, by, I wouldn't say transparency, but review perhaps. Okay, yeah. maybe a little review, and, um, and so I, I feel the same way as Phil. I actually like it. I value their opinions. Um, I feel like once when, when we get an application that's been through the DRC and we're able to review that, then it, it, it adds kind of a, an, another, um, you know, more expert, I guess, witness to, yeah. to what you guys have proposed. So we've always, I, we've always appreciated their input yeah. to us. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm a little uncomfortable with, with re removing it as well. Appreciate knowing that. So I have a question along those lines. I agree with the comments. That's why I initially had concerns. So now I'm jumping around a little bit. So, okay. Mr. Chair, tell me what you like to do with this. But I wonder if there's so many, I think there's at least four topics to talk about tonight. Are we going to vote all, on all of them as one or in separate sections, so separate parts? It's, it's one vote. It's one vote. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> to, to be clear, it is one vote, but to, to be clear, if, if, if I may, you can, you can recommend it. Amen. You can recommend approval. You can recommend denial. You can recommend approval with certain changes. Nothing okay. prohibits you from making changes That's to what we've proposed as a draft here tonight. And, it, it, and I think when we make council. a motion later on, uh, we can add to that motion if there are addition or if there are changes that we would like to see in the language uh, before anything goes to the city council. Right. Then, Phil, you'll make sure we include the DRC discussion in that. I'm sure someone will. <clears throat> All right. Anything else for staff? I had one, one other thing, and I can't quite read what I wrote. Um, I know sorry. you. You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just felt like for the sake of the public and everyone in discussion tonight, if you could discuss the heights in the neighborhood west of State Street again. I believe sure. because we misstated something earlier. 
before you got into detail about the chart. Let me get to the larger, to the map. So you mean west of State Street? West of State so Street. To be, to be clear, there are kind of two main height rules right now. There, there are very simple rules for height in the MCCD zone, and they are as follows. West of State Street, when you build, you have a minimum height requirement. You're required to build at least four stories or 40 feet, whichever is the lesser. Um, east of State Street, in this area right, well, I'm going to get the wrong spot. East, north of Center, north of Court Avenue, and along Center Street, you're required to only build 35 feet. That's the maximum height if your property is adjacent to Center Street in the MCCD zone. Uh, and then there is the overriding 150, and this applies to both sides of the street. East of State Street, you're exempt from the minimum build height build requirement, but you're not you're not limited in height by anything other than the same thing that limits height in the west side of State Street, which is that distance to residential zoning boundaries. It's just a lot more prevalent on the east side of State Street in this area than it is on the west side because most of this area is just out of that out of that problem. So that's that's the main difference. Jared, if I if I sure. can, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to clarify that you're not required on the east side of State Street to build 35 feet. You would be limited, limited to, 30. to 35 feet or less. Um, and then just going back to the, the overall height restrictions in the zone, that's one of the elements that I feel like we really were thoughtful in taking into consideration feedback from the the public constituents um, that council members heard from when the proposals came through the RDA on that block of property that the RDA owns between um, 48th and 5th Avenue State and Poplar. Um, the developer proposed some buildings that exceeded the height that we have, the height limitation at that 135 feet. And that really didn't go over well with the elected officials. There were a lot of concerns that came out of that from the community and from residents who, who spoke out and said that they didn't, you know, wouldn't want to see something as high as what was proposed. So that was one element where we feel like we really listened to the feedback and, um, and have kept that at the 135 feet restrictions so 135 feet or less there wouldn't be any building in the MCCD zone that would exceed 135 feet perfect thank you anything else thank you all right now we'll open this agenda item up for public comment I know there are quite a few of you up here who would like to comment so I'd ask you to please come forward state your name and your address for the record and they'll be limited to three minutes and as commissioner wilson suggests uh, we'd ask you to limit your comments to three minutes if you're talking for yourself and five minutes if you're talking for a group okay thank you uh, my name is rebecca santa cruz i w live at 5197 south wesley road and uh, i am the current chairman of the history advisory board and the owner of a historic home listed on the national register uh, the first thing I have uh, for input is that the uh, NCCD um, code uh, is the result of 13 public meetings and open houses and input, and that's including the name change. It's far less restrictive than the Historic Overlay District code, which uh, was implemented in 2005. First thing, kudos for the new incentive program, waiving permits and fees for those who want to restore or renovate historic buildings with uh, you know, state incentives and national incentives. That could make restoration a viable option to people who might not otherwise be able to do this so. Um, I guess the big issue is the list of historic buildings. According to Murray Municipal Code 2.41.040, a major purpose of the History Advisory Board is to advise, advise officials of the city regarding the identification and protection of local historic and archaeological resources and to encourage historic preservation by maintaining a local register and inventory of historic structures. The History Board also prepares the applications for national recognition of a historic property, which comes right from that list. It's, it's a, an easy flow from that. 
uh, our concerns are removal of the historic list of buildings from the ordinance seems like an op open invitation for demolition. If the CED staff is in charge of the list, what would be the criteria under which it would operate? The very restrictive historic overlay district codes were only written in 2005 and have already been revised to loosen the restriction based on public input. In the interest of transparency, how would the CED use the list and how would they continue the History Board's mission of National Historical Register submissions? Uh, if private property owners can request removal fr from a list simply by submitting a request to the mayor's office, what's to prevent a developer from buying a historic property uh, which is on the list and then with the full intention of demolishing it, then going to the mayor's office and saying I'd like to demolish it and demolishing it? Where's the protection? I'm not seeing that anymore. Um, right now, uh, if a, a listed building is going to, it wants to be demolished, they would submit that request to the history board and they look at it and it's, it's a good opportunity for education. I'd like to know if the history board could remain involved in this process since preservation is our bailiwick and uh, the same would apply to addition of, of properties. There is currently a clear criteria for removal from the list that's in the code. And maybe it, the language could be softened a little bit to number one, the owner of the property would suffer financial hardship and be deprived of economic return. Number two, the value of the owner's property would be diminished. And having a property sit empty diminishes the owner's value. A building has been verified as unsafe and repairs are impractical. Well, again, if a building sits empty for a long time, I know my house was empty for 24 years. I'm still repairing some of the damage. Uh, you can definitely, that could definitely be a criteria. But again, those are all in the code. Those are all part of um, being able to uh, remove a building from the list. Regarding forcing property owners to remain on a list against their will, perhaps an, a reasonable approach might be that if you've owned the property since before the um, historic overlay district was implemented, then maybe you qualify for removal from the list. However, if you bought a historical property and you knew going into it what the restrictions were, then why do you suddenly just get to change the game? It seems to me like there should be more of a balance between the two. It shouldn't be so hard to get remo removed and it shouldn't be so easy. There should be something in between. <clears throat> and the last thing is going to be that if a historic property is demolished, there really should be more extensive mitigation than a plaque. You know, uh, there should be a little more that tells the story than a little thing like this. And so um, that's, that's currently in the code. Your time's almost up. Okay. Just in, my family's been in the Murray area since 1847, and we've watched Murray Mac wax and wane. I know that the only thing constant is change, but not all changes are for the better. In the interest of transparency and democratic input that crafted the current MCCD code, I'd urge you to remember that a future that does not respect its past soon forgets it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> yes, please state your name and your address for the record. Thank you. I'm uh, Mike Lamson, uh, 2004 South, 1600 East Salt Lake. Good evening. My name is Mike Lamson. Our family owns the former Murray Library building and the former Murray First Ward Church building right here on Vine Street. Uh, we operated Mount Vernon Academy, a private K-12 school in those buildings for 42 years. We relocated two and a half years ago to another location here in Murray. I would like to say that um, my family is very much in favor of the ordinance change that is being discussed here tonight. We have suffered great financial strain because of the current ordinance that is in place. We went under contract to sell our properties four years ago to a developer that was looking to take down one of the buildings and put it in, in an assisted living center. 
but we were eventually blocked from doing so uh, due to the many appeals and lawsuit of, of one Murray resident. During that time, we did reach out um, um, asking to, that those be uh, the appeals go away in the lawsuit, but uh, to no avail. Um, the developer eventually backed out, and we have been unsuccessful in selling the property since then. Having a neighbor uh, interfere, when, no hard feelings by the way, with the sale of our property has cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars up until now. We have shown the property to hundreds of interested parties, but we have not been able to sell them. <clears throat> the cost to restore and get the buildings up to code, coupled with strict guidelines and oversight in the design review phase are probably the biggest reasons for this. Uh, we battle every day to keep these vacant buildings from continued deterioration. <clears throat> the roofs on both buildings have major leak issues and eventually will give way to Mother Nature. We have, made multiple we have had multiple break-ins um, in the last few months that have caused substantial damage and vandalism. Keeping the transient, po transient population out has been a major problem. I have run into them on multiple occasions while checking the properties. I've asked the Murray City Police Department to assist me in keeping an extra eye out during their nightly watches and they have obliged me in this request. We have to care for the grounds and the buildings continuously to try and make them somewhat attractive to the community even though we're not in them. This takes a lot of time and money to do so. We still have mortgages on the buildings. We make monthly utility payments and continue to pay property taxes. As you can see, we are not enjoying having these buildings in our possession at the moment. Eventually what will happen is the banks will own, take ownership. With that, we will see boarded up windows, um, uh, chain link fences around the perimeter. I don't believe anyone wants to see this to happen or see this happen. We all know what this type of uh, look will bring to Murray. More transients, drug use, vandalism, graffiti, and crime. Giving back our family the freedom to do what we know is best for our own buildings is what we are most interested in. Private property rights are a very important right and part of being an American. We have definitely felt that our property rights have been violated these past four years. Uh, it, it almost seems our neighbors have more property rights than we do. Allowing property owners the right to decide whether to be included or not included in an historically significant building ordinance will be a game changer for our family. I applaud, I applaud those that have thought about our plight and the plight of other Murray City property owners in creating a new ordinance. Thank you for the opportunity to express my viewpoint tonight. Thank you very much. Other comments regarding this agenda item? Please state your name and your address for the record. Uh, Andy Holka, 1396 East Greenfield. Um, I uh, here just as a concerned resident, but I do volunteer on the DRC. One of the newer members I've been on for almost a year. I uh, wanted to come, firstly, uh, give thanks to city staff who are doing a great job, I think. This is uh, pretty difficult. It's a big change, but um, they've done a lot of good work. I do have a few concerns, though. Uh, I think that the DRC is a good um, a check and balance in the system. It's a, It does provide another layer. Uh, it does... I suppose make it more difficult for development to come through but in my brief experience I've found that it's been a good process it's led to good outcomes and led to uh, more quality for our city having a design review board or historic preservation committee I think is an important way to ensure that we preserve the special character that exists in our city center and so I you know personally just personally as a resident here, I, I think that it would be a mistake to get rid of the DRC. Uh, there are a couple other things. Uh, some of the language has been changed uh, to be phrased along the lines of wherever practical, practicable or where possible. Those, you know, softening of the rules make it, Again, just uh, the harder to get to the vision that the city has put forth with the design guidelines, the general plan, and the ordinance. Um, I would like to echo the comments that have been made about historic preservation. 
um, allowing people to just request to be removed from the historic preservation list will effectively be a loophole from the standards in the ordinance for demolishing or renovating historic properties. Um, the sustainability standards, some parts have been removed. I'd like to point out that I, it, it was mentioned in the staff report, but there are no longer any sustainability requirements for non-public properties. Um, I think in this day and age, sustainability is a topic that comes up a lot. I think a lot of residents will say that something that we are, really care about, are passionate about, and we should be pushing as a city to keep sustainability requirements in the code. One of the changes that was made um, was that tree preservation outside of the building footprint, I think it was 15 feet outside of the building footprint, used to be required. Now it's just encouraged. Um, again, I, I think that the previous ordinance with the language using shalls instead of shoulds, it's a more effective way to achieve our goals. The new public improvements and street character section of the code, um, I do appreciate that I think it will help the staff to implement the design guidelines, but um, again, uses the wherever practicable language and there's no, in the drawing, I didn't see any bike lanes or bike infrastructure notes. I think that's really important for a city center downtown district something that should be considered. Um, so again, while I, I do think that the staff here in Murray does a great job, I think that they're in, they will do a good job in reviewing, but uh, it, it, I could envision a scenario where you know the city or the RDA is a large landowner in this district, will be developing many properties and going through this process and without having the additional design review, then it's up to staff to make recommendations. It could be difficult as staff to make a recommendation that, you know, the city has to change something. They work for the city. It, just something that I think having the extra layer of a design review committee helps give an outside perspective and enforce some of these guidelines. Um, so I, I hope that you'll consider some of those, perhaps maybe consider amending or making a recommendation to change, revisit, and come back with a better version of this amendment. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Sam Eads, and I live at 379 East Vine Street. Um, and I echo the sentiments of my fellow um, Murray citizens. Um, so I'll try not to repeat any of what they said. Um, but I have two major concerns with this proposed amendment. The first is under subsection 60, and it's kind of been mentioned. Um, it's the removal of the list, um, you know, the, the keeping of, of it out of the public eye and out of the statute um, and making it completely voluntary um, where anyone can, you know, remove themselves from that list within 30 days with no notice or uh, any opportunity for the public to object. Um, so that kind of guts the entire core of that historical preservation section. Um, so, you know, even the mention of, of the plaques that were talked about, if someone wants to demolish their building and not put up a plaque, they can just submit a notice that they don't want to be on that list anymore. Um, and then they're free to demolish their their building. Um, the second item dovetails with that, that's under subsection 40, the design review process. And um, you know, my major concern with that is, is the entire removal of um, the design re review process over demolitions. Uh, so it allows anyone to, in the MCCD area to demolish without any concern for being in the MCCD um, area. So anyone, you know, any historic uh, property that all predates everyone in this room um, could simply be demolished just by taking them, their, their name off the list um, and, you know, skirting the entire design review process 
um, and then just show up later for for a permit after after the whole historic nature of, of the building has just been demolished um, and this also kind of reverses incentives um, the divine design review process is in place if you want to update or remodel or keep your historic property in place um, but if you want to demolish it and put up some new you know stuccoed building um, there's nothing in this whole uh, historical preservation section that that would stop that um, so it it leaves a rule section 60 that's kind of a shell that has no no teeth um, or really much of a benefit other than the the waiver of of um, the fees um, and it also inverts the incentives by saying you know you're not subject to this entire section if you want to demolish your building um, so thank you for your time thank you Kathleen Stanford, I live at 487 East Vine Street. I would like to um, submit a letter to be um, recorded on the, in the record from uh, Marianne Kirk, retired cultural programs manager. So, I don't know who I think you. Uh, okay. Really? <laughs> Um, we can we can read it into the record that's that's fine okay I don't want to take my time to do that I also want to read into the record that um, this is a quote from Alan Roberts a fellow of the American Institute of Architecture uh, renovation of well-constructed structures is less expensive than comparable new construction usually by about 20 percent this is because the excavations, footings, and foundations, structural walls, floors, and roof have already been built and long ago paid for, not needing to be paid for again, even if the building is structurally, mechanically, and electrically upgraded, given new architectural finishes and brought entirely up to code. The cost of these improvements is only about 80% of the cost of new construction. You all know that I am sincerely sorry for the pain that I caused Mike Lamson. I feel very bad about it, but a developer, people have property rights, but developers should not have rights over citizens that value their history and their architecture of a town that, that I value and I love, that my ancestors built, that has been part of my, my whole um, person. And I have been, as you know, I have, I have uh, set up a nonprofit foundation. We are raising money to renovate Mike Lamson's building with whoever is willing to buy it. There have been many people willing to buy that building, but not being able to get past the banks that will not give them loans because there is a leak in the roof. Can't we sit down at the table? Can't we, as people who love our city, sit down and talk about these things, about how to solve these problems, rather than point fingers at preservation. Is preservation, is, is historic preservation, are the historic properties the problem here? Are they the reasons that the downtown is not being renovated? I wish we could just get together and find a way. I think that we could be creative enough to find a way to solve some of these problems. Um, I know that Jim Brass has suggested why not require any new construction three quarters of one percent for of, of their uh, cost go to a fund to help the city could have bought Mike Lamson's property for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then we, as a nonprofit foundation, would have just taken that. We are raising money now, but we don't have 750000 We would have helped renovate that if the, and, and paid it back to the city if we could have. We need to find some other ideas to try to do something. I also want to point out I'm a little bit worried about gutting that historic preservation um, thing because uh, Murray is a certified uh, local government, a CLG, and they get grants 
from the State Historic Preservation Office. This comes from the State Historic Preservation Office webpage. To become a certified local government, a local government must pass an, must pass an approved historic preservation ordinance and appoint a historic preservation commission. The historic preservation ordinance must be approved in order to be a CLG or they are not um, eligible for any grants. I would, this may be a problem. I would think that we would want to look at this before we would pass any new ordinance about historic preservation in the city. You guys are doing a great job and I know it's a really hard job and this has been a really difficult situation and and we all want Murray to be vibrant I, I just hope that we can come to the table get a little bit more public input especially from from a nonprofit for example that has a prominent president presence in um, in the city historic Murray First Foundation and others that are concerned about this thank you so much for your time thank you My name is Delyn Barney. I live at 4902 South Box Elder Street. I live in the MCCD district. I've lived in that area since the uh, 60s, been a variety of different districts over the years. Um, last night, I arrived home to find my home broken into. There are some personal items that I found missing that was of uh, uh, personal value, not a lot of monetary value. And then I opened up my emails and rem was reminded of the uh, meeting tonight of uh, the uh, changes in the ordinance that basically, in my mind, is gutting the preservation of historic buildings in this area. I don't know which one eats at me the worst, whether the breaking in, breaking in of my home or the lack of the historic buildings within the uh, district that uh, some of I've some I've grown to uh, love over the years for a long time I attended the Murray first ward I went to school here in this when this was an elementary school I do believe that the design review committee should be kept so that there's somebody else in the loop besides the employees of Murray City um, if we forget about our history whether it be historical buildings or properties that that's what ties us to the past and that's what ties us to our future generations how many of us would be willing to have the national mall in washington dc turned into a economic development zone i'm sh i'm sure there's some people that could put some businesses in and make a lot of money same way with uh, parks like uh, yellowstone or any other any of the other national parks they're there for a purpose to help us to remember some of the things that we have lost in the past and that we still need to keep. Um, as far as that historic building list being taken off of the, the, the list, if it's not there, to me it's just kind of a gee whiz list. Hey, that's nice to have them buildings on there, but it means nothing. It's like having a speed, a, uh, a speed limit without any, any enforceable laws to, that pertains to it. It just well, yeah, you're supposed to go 45, but hey, if you're going 60, that's fine. Uh, we need to have some, some balance in uh, providing for the, our, the generations that come after us so that they can look back at Murray and instead of just seeing uh, a bunch of buildings that uh, uh, provide an economic base, they uh, will provide something that the citizens can look at and uh, be proud that they're part of Murray City, not just some uh, fancy structure. Uh, many years ago, I was in the Marine Corps in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and I saw where some of the businesses that had put uh, developments above the ground level, residents above the ground level, and then they had businesses in the lower level. At, at night, they were just empty. There was not pe the people weren't going to them, and uh, it was kind of a empty, desolate uh, uh, scene. Your time's just about up. Okay. When, I'm, when my family moved here, this was a walkable area. I could walk to a grocery store. I could walk to a hardware store. I could walk to my church. And always, and now when Fashion Place Mall went in, the economic development pretty much gutted that. 
and uh, I feel there needs to be a, a balance between the economic development but also historical preservation so we can keep some of what we have now because once it's gone it's gone it doesn't come back thank you very much thank you thank you very much <clears throat> Hi, my name is Rachel Morrow. I live at 741 East Arrowhead Lane, and I am Vice President of the Board of the Murray, uh, Historic Murray First Foundation. I'd like to read Mary Ann Kirk's letter into the record. Dear Planning and Zoning Commission, I was informed late last night of an effort to modify city code related to historic preservation in the MCCD zone. Because this was a major part of my work in the city, I would like to provide a brief perspective and a few questions as you consider this proposal. Historic preservation is not just about an old building that people are emotionally attached to, <clears throat> although that is very real to some. There is value in preserving physical history of a building to recognize the community's past. Historic buildings also have architectural features and building styles that contribute to its surroundings. Where properly preserved and rehabilitated, these buildings often provide unique branding and marketing tools for local businesses and economic development. So my big question to you <coughs> and other city leaders is, does the city value its past, including its historic built environment, and if so, how does it honor that? If the city does value preserving some of its key historic buildings, how can the city be proactive in promoting the preservation of critical buildings? What incentives is it willing to provide? What and how is protection provided for those buildings deemed very important for preservation? Perhaps a revised list can be considered. Are there needs of the city that can be met by historic buildings? Where buildings cannot be saved, what kind of mitigation honors and provides an appropriate glimpse into history? How does the city properly balance private developers and property rights with the city's inter interests and vision? Does one take precedence over the other? Perhaps now would be a good time to revisit the vision of the MCCD. What types of building use, uses, material, and scale does the city want, and does the actual boundary of the district realistically facilitate that vision? Are there certain areas where the height and scale might differ, such as east of State Street, adjacent to residential neighborhoods versus west of State. Thank you for taking the time to consider these ideas. Sincerely, Marianne Kirk, retired cultural programs manager, Murray City. Thanks. Thank you for, very much for reading that into the record for us. Are there others who would like to provide public comment? Please. My name is Janice Strobel and I live at 4912 Wasatch. I was not going to speak, but I wanted to kind of give you um, what has been my experience in having attended a couple of the DRC um, meetings in the last year. And I think that what the concern about removing that is very valid. Um, one of the things that I experienced uh, attending the last one was seeing the proposed development on a whole different way, being able to listen to the um, to those at, that were part of the design review committee that could be on record <laughs> at that meeting, um, and what they had to say, and seeing the the design and and really kind of soaking that in, it was really valuable for me. It allowed me then to take time as a public, as a, as a citizen, to look into it more. The sad thing is, as a citizen, I, there, wasn't, there wasn't any opportunity for me to do anything um, really that would be on record until this meeting. And past experience has been that by the time things get to this meeting, a lot of things have been very deeply worked through. I really appreciate all the work that the staff has done and all that you have done to review what the staff has done. You have really worked hard, and that has been really, you know, very valuable. I did talk to Melinda <laughs> earlier today saying if there were a way that there could be um, a committee <clears throat> 
that could somehow be of citizens, business, property owners, of, similar to what Kathleen's at mentioning, is being able to come together and talk about solutions and ideas and be able to be part of the solution rather than what, what it feels like so many times at, when we do finally have the opportunity to make comment and be on record, it feels like it is so much after the fact. And that's, um, that's been a real challenge for me to deal with is, is feeling like there hasn't been many opportunities to really help work through the situation because you know we're just we're citizens we're not on staff and we're not on a on a on a board so that is um something that i think is going to be super valuable in really doing an effective downtown redevelopment is gathering public input and first from all the citizens that will contribute to that public input but then some way of looking at a way that um we can do that in a committee that wants to be involved, that wants to be engaged, and wants to help find solutions, somehow maybe the DRC and the and a public um, input kind of coming together at, at in that same time period, not trying to add another extra layer, but finding value in that um, extra review that you guys have all mentioned is very valuable about the DRC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Wendy Parsons Baker. I live at 190 East, 5600 South. I'm a born and raised Murrayite and pretty proud of it. Uh, my family owns uh, a couple of historic buildings on uh, 48 South. We own the old uh, Sheranian Hospital and we also own a house uh, on uh, 4841 South State. Uh, we hope to keep those uh, in the family and keep those preserved. Uh, I think it's pretty important for Murray City to uh, respect what we what we have and maintain the uh, the the uh, maintain Murray City how it how it is. Uh, uh, I also serve on the historic board uh, committee and I uh, I. I always hate when I when we have uh, when we have things come through. They're saying that they're going to demolish something. I think a lot, you know, some of those building those properties do need to be demolished. Uh, the Richard Howe home on 5600 South and about uh, 750 East, I think, was a tragedy that we lost that in Murray City. Uh, was a it was a beautiful place, uh, but once we tear them down, they are gone forever. And uh, I hope we keep I hope we keep our list of of homes and uh, and do something really nice with with Murray City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Brent Barnett. I'm at uh, 491 Vine. Uh, I'm so glad to meet with you tonight, and we really appreciate you taking the time. We know you're not paid for your services, and we appreciate the time you spend of our city, uh, and that you are looking over the concerns of the people. Uh, I have just a few comments to read here, and uh, maybe I can just make a few observations. Th uh, I want to also thank all the officials who work to be up to date on the good practice in city planning, because I know you guys are working to make our city the best possible city. And your professional expertise is extremely important. And the fact that we've been able to bring in Melinda and uh, Zach, who have uh, great backgrounds and interesting perspectives from their own cities of Midvale and Ogden has been really helpful. Uh, and they've all treated me so well, so I thank you for that. I think we also owe thank you, thanks to all those who preserve the great architecture. That includes uh, Mike Todd, that includes the, uh, the Days, that includes, of course, Susan Wright, and of course the Lamsons, who have been so wonderful. And we are anxious to have uh, solutions that we can work with them so that their properties can be preserved and, and uh, 
help the future. Um, I also hope that we will, everything people have said has been so good, and you've heard from so many people, and all of them have had interesting things to say. And I hope you will continue to send the mayor, help him understand that the solution will be better if we spend the time to work together. And I think he's open to that. Um, so to talk about our situation, where we are right now, just a, just a few points. First of all, I know you've worked really hard on this proposal. It's pages and pages, and I'm sure it is a really great start. And I know you guys, I know how it is to work through proposals. You always hope you're at the end, but you're really at the beginning. Uh, and I hope you can understand that and help the mayor understand that and the city council, if they're willing to continue to work with the citizens. Uh, but a few problems there. I think few, very few citizens that we have to address. One, very few citizens had any knowledge of this meeting. Um, we found out about it at the last minute. The posting on the website is so deep in the website, no one knows it. I think it's absolutely necessary for transparent government that every citizen knows this meeting's happening. That could be handled by an email to everyone who contributes their uh, email address in the city. Could be just churned out there. Anyone could get an email. The technology is there to do it, we, and I think the citizens will be glad to uh, invest in that technology. Uh, the new city of Mill Creek, they're not as good as Murray, but, <laughs> but they send out a weekly newsletter on email, tells everything that's going on. We do not do that. We ought to do that. We ought to be up to date. Uh, we send out a thing with the power bill. That's great. But hey, it's the 21st century, so my kids tell me. You're just about out of time. OK, let me mention two more things. The proposed changes in the code were never available to the citizens. How could we be expected to comp comment on this complex issue? They were not available, all that stuff, until we walked in here. Three, the number of issues are way too much for one meeting, I think. As I have told Melinda, it isn't easy for a Provo Bulldog to keep pace with the brain of an Orm Tiger. That's time. For if this is to be taken seriously, it has to be treated seriously. The MCCD took 13 more minutes. In conclusion, I say, as far as I understand, our mayor, the good man that he is, is anxious to serve the citizens. He is anxious to figure out how our city can have transparent processes in this situation and in all others. This will become a bigger issue as our citizens, citizens take hold of it and even in the next election. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments? Please come forward. Hi, uh, Kim Anderson, 1144 Chevy Chase Drive. And yes, we are part of Salt Lake City, in spite of us being Murray the ugly city. stepsister area. Murray City. I mean, what did I say? Uh, Salt Lake City. I work in Salt Lake City, sorry. So we are part of uh, Murray City. Sorry about that. I know, I know where I am. Uh, there are a couple things. One that I'm concerned about also is, is the lack of meetings that, that will be, supposedly will take place on this. Uh, when the MCCD was originally proposed, I know the city had lots and lots of meetings, and I attended many of those. And not only that, I made, uh, uh, I made lots of suggestions, and some of those suggestions were accepted, some were not in that uh, compromise, I, I'll call it that way. And I would hope that this not be passed tonight, that we take more time to get the citizen involved. I, I think that, that uh, you've had, of all the people here, I've only heard one negative, really, to uh, what's going on, um, or one pro in favor of what's being proposed. There are a few things. Uh, they talk about current trends on, in buildings. Current trends are buildings that are going to last and look like downtown uh, anywhere USA. And that's not what Murray is. Doug Wright was talking on the radio a few weeks ago and says, you know, I drove down through Murray the other day, and you know where it is. It's got that great downtown. Well, it does, but it's not what's being envisioned to be kept. Uh, uh, is my opinion from this, this ordinance and other ordinances. If the, um, the design review committee is done away with um, and the mayor is able to be the only one that can uh, 
respond or report to that. We already know what the mayor thinks about it. He wrote it about, about it in the Murray Journal a, co a couple months ago that he wants to have a lot of the buildings demolished. He wants to bring in renovation. Um, you know, a city is defined by its people and its buildings and its heritage. And if you come into a build, if you come into a city and you buy a, a, a property, historic property like uh, this woman did over here or other people have, you know what you're getting into. And, and that's why you bought it. The historic nature of buildings is major. Um, there are a group of us that have been working for five or six, seven months now uh, trying to find ways to, to preserve Murray's history and historical buildings. We've walked the, the downtown area. We've looked at old photographs. And there are areas. There's a facade uh, restoration fund that is like $40,000 given to you by the federal government to restore historic uh, facades. You do have to meet certain conditions and you'd have to pay prevailing wages. So it's a little more expensive work. I've done two of those projects in Salt Lake City with uh, not myself, but as an architect. A and those things can be done. If, um, uh, I think if we lose the historic nature of downtown Murray, we're going to be anywhere USA and Murray will no longer have its good look or its good name other than the people that live here. Um, I walked, my daughter goes to- You're about out of time. Um, can I represent the MCCD? Murray City, what? MCDC. MCDC, it's the group of people that's been organized. Anyway, I walked downtown, old downtown um, uh, Cedar City with my daughter a couple weeks ago and it's a great old city and they haven't come in and put in the hotel down on the corner of Vine and State Street. They haven't done those things in their old downtown and it's a great area. And the stores are, may not be super thriving but almost all of them were filled. Uh, it was a fun place to walk down and I was glad I took my daughter down there. I think there are things that can be done and I think that the biggest thing we should do is allow more time for this to happen. Um, you know, I, if I would not have gotten an email from a, a friend know about this meeting, I would have not have known about it, even though I do look at the agendas every week uh, for the three main groups. Anyway, I would just suggest you table it or let us have more input. This is a big deal. This is not just um, staff and the mayor and you guys. It's everybody. Anyway, I appreciate your work, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Others who would like to make public comment? Last opportunity this evening to get more. All right, seeing no more people come into the podium. I will close the public comment period and bring it up here to perhaps Jared, you want to answer a few questions that um, <laughs> we received? <laughs> a, a few? A couple? Just a couple of I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I could no. that I could possibly no. kind of address all of that, but um, they're, they're good points and, and um, they're all things that we've been thinking about as we, <laughs> as we look at this issue. Um, one thing, if I can, if I can work backwards, um, monies that are available for historic res restoration, facade grants from the federal government or from the state, if they're available, uh, we don't have any to offer as Murray right now—a facade program, a renovation program, et cetera. Tax credits from the state or from the federal government; those are not off the table because of an ordinance change. Those are on the table right now. They're on; the, they were on the table 25 years ago. Um, they'll be on the table in 10 years, regardless of what we do. Those monies are still there and available, and nothing here precludes anyone from owning one of these buildings and seeking those kinds of grants or funds. Our issue in, in suggesting that we need to make a change to the way we have approached historic preservation in the MCCD specifically is that none of those things have happened. These, these buildings have, some of the buildings have not been maintained, and I'm not gonna drag back to the, the pictures, but Murray has invested significant funds as a city in doing some of those renovation programs and in buying buildings and investing more public funds, and these are public funds. This is, this is your money, and it's the money of 50,000 other people that aren't here represented tonight. Um, 
that's not an insignificant issue, and I think it needs to be said. The other thing that I would point out is that um, other homes and and the, we can't really take on and are not t attempting to take on by proposing this change the duties of the history advisory board, making recommendations for properties to to be nominated to the federal register. That's still all in their purview. We're talking about 100 acres of the downtown where most of those buildings have already been nominated. We, we wouldn't presume to try to, to take over those kinds of duties. Those are all still resting with the HAP. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can really address. We, and there's, there's a, there is, I just, just really quickly, I guess, as a final note, um, just so you can all understand kind of where we're coming from as, as staff. His, historic preservation is extremely important to us, and I, I won't go into the details of everybody's different stories, but we all have, we all have those situations too. Um, and uh, some of these buildings that are important to us, that are important to the historic character of downtowns and of, of different cities, not just Murray, but all over the state, are like ticking time bombs, waiting, everyone's waiting to see what's gonna happen. But these are private properties. Where we've been able to, the city has taken some of those properties out of private hands and into public hands. And then it is, then the question is the we that gets mentioned. When we, once we remove these buildings, then they're gone forever. There isn't a lot of we when, when we're talking about some of these buildings. It's somebody that owns those buildings that's making those decisions or should be making those decisions in our view. Um, where we have control of those buildings, we as Murray City will preserve them the ones that we've been able to preserve and protect and buy so far. Um, I guess that's basically what I would say in response. Any other questions from, from the comments that you would have as staff that we could try to respond to for you from specific specifics, sorry. You know, Jared, I know there were several comments brought up about a lack of communication in that, and and I, I do share those. Um, it's unfortunate that um, several years ago, Murray lost their only city newspaper when the green sheet went out of business the murray eagle the green sheet and there has been a void that has never been filled and whether the city can find a way to do that that's for another committee another person we don't control that we we are the planning and zoning and that's not in our purvey is to to attack that but i do share those concerns i wish the city did have a newsletter that went out weekly to all utility accounts or whoever wants to sign up. There's, there's a lot of things you can do, but that, that has nothing to do with this committee. And a lot of folks do get an email about the agendas. They get emailed copies of the agendas and things going on. That's something you can sign up for in the city. We don't have, as was mentioned, the, the weekly news feed like Mill Creek City, et cetera. Right. Thank you. Anything else? All right, so other comments, discussion uh, by the commissioners? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll, I'll get mine out of the way. Um, first of all, I, I have a great concern about eliminating the DRC, the Design Review Committee. I really think it's important for us to have their eyes look at these applications, and I understand the concern. If it delays the process, perhaps there's something I would encourage the city staff or whoever is responsible for establishing those timelines maybe they need maybe, maybe they can meet more than once a month um, maybe there, there are other ways that we can involve them uh, but I do think that it is important to have those eyes review items in this area partic uh, in particular I, I think it's crucial and I have really appreciated their involvement in the past for me personally since I've been on this co uh, this commission for the last eight years I have one year left my greatest personal frustration has been the lack of progress in downtown Murray. It has been talked about well before I got on this committee and since we have, since I have been on this committee for over eight years, we talk, we talk, we talk and nothing happens. And as, as staff said, these incentives have been in place for a very long time and nothing is happening. What is happening is those buildings are deteriorating. They're having temporary businesses move in that, you know, that's, it, it's just not a good situation. The buildings are gonna fall down. You heard Mr. Lampson, the roofs are going, the electrical is failing, the plumbing is failing in these places. Are we waiting for a fire or a catastrophe to knock them down? And then what, we're gonna rebuild them exactly as they were and create a Disneyland in downtown Murray that looks like old Murray when we were kids and we went to Carlson's bike shop 
and Hendrick's Shoe Store and J.C. Penney's and, and the drug store. I was there. I did that. It was lovely, but it doesn't represent reality now. We need to do something about downtown Murray, and it's, what, it's way overdue. This is an attempt to spur some action, and I support it for the most part. My two major concerns are the DRC removal, and also I am not comfortable with an individual property owner saying that they can remove their structure from a historic site. Those are the two issues that I take issue with in this. Thank you. Commissioner. Just to add some to, to what Commissioner Markham said, um, I travel for work a lot around the country, and, and I, I go to a lot of downtowns, and, you know, they look dilapidated, and there may be a building that is 50 or 70 or 100 years old that may be historical, but no one's done anything with it, and it just turns into more of a blighted area. And, and so I, I share much of the, the concern with, with Mr. Markham is, is you know i've been on the commission as long as phil and and we want things to happen we want murray to be a vibrant downtown we want it to be able to respect the history and the past but also be able to um, be business friendly and development friendly so that it that it can be vibrant and, and and i absolutely agree that that i do not like the idea of the the drc being removed um, as far as the historical list goes um, I understand to an extent why you'd want to take it out of the code because we know that, you know, to change the code and different things it requires going to the city council. But I, I would like to see, I don't like the idea of someone submitting an application to the, to the staff. I, w I would like to see some sort of, you know, whether it's submitted to the staff and the historical board or uh, some other community or public interaction on that rather than just allowing a, a private owner to, to submit an application. I certainly want to respect the rights of, like Mr. Lamson said, uh, and I understand where he's coming from, um, but I, I would like to see those two items really dealt with seriously on how we can still provide a process and a little more um, checks and balances on the historical buildings. Um, but whether it's in the ordinance or not, to me, I don't, I'm not as concerned about that side, just the process of someone removing their property, so. All right, thank you. Other um, thoughts? I kind of feel like um, this needs a little bit more fine tuning and I'm not, sure what our process is for that but as it currently stands i feel like we're it's not quite what we need well, I, i'm a little bit concerned about so i agree with everything that was said so i'm not going to repeat it i agree i'm in the same place i'm concerned we keep saying this because i think this needs to be defined i think everything said in this proposal is great except removing the drc and concerns about a personal property owner right taking their name off the list. So is, how do we move forward with those, that thought? How can we address everything's great except those two things? <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe I'd ask you, Jared Molina, can you give us a little guidance? I mean, we could probably make a motion with uh, uh, several caveats in it regarding things like the uh, DRC and a better process to go through to, to get a property. Um, off the list, if you will, or and or uh, what to actually do with the um, properties deemed historical list, keeping that in the ordinance versus taking it out. I mean, there are right. a, there, those are probably the handful that come to mind first. There are probably, if we keep talking, uh, a number of other items that this group uh, would think about uh, adjusting in the ordinance before we actually. Uh, send it to the city council. Right, and those are kind of your your. Sorry, those are kind of the choices you have. Is that on? You. Is it on? Am I I'm just. There you I'm just. I cease to exist or something. It's not recognizing me. It's uh, it, you have a couple of choices. If you um, if if you wanted to try to make a motion to forward it with a recommendation that those kind of things be changed before it goes to city council, that your recommendation would include doing these things but that you're you recommend changes to how we deal with the removal of properties from the list and and not and, and where the list is kept how, how the list is if it stays codified or or is removed from code that you're uncomfortable with that 
Um, I'm not sure what kind of a process. I don't, I don't have an easy answer for what that process would look like, um, Commissioner Mikhevich, Commissioner Wilson. What does it look like to, if it's not a property owner requesting to be removed from the list and being removed? What are the criteria? We have some simple criteria for getting on the list. Um, it was mentioned um, by Rebecca, actually, that, that there's a criteria in the code right now for getting off of, it, it's really not the criteria for getting removed from the list, it's the criteria for allowing demolition. And the first three stages of it are, are pretty basic. And then it gets specific about what you have to, how you have to perform to, and to go ahead and, and accomplish that demolition. But the criteria for it are pretty basic. Dim, diminution of, of value of the property, et cetera. Maybe those could serve as, as something that, that could create a process. I'm not prepared right now to say what that should look like or, or I propose anything to you. So. I don't know. Your other option would be to, to continue the item and ask us to look at those issues. Keeping the DRC in place with the other changes is possible. It doesn't really, it doesn't change, it doesn't have to change, what are we trying to say? You don't have to keep everything else related to design guidelines not changing at all to keep the DRC. They're not tied to that. They could remain if that's what you wish. So we could, we could remove that and that seems easier and simpler to, to do as a change than creating a new process for removal from the list. That's probably tougher. Um, does that make sense? Mr. Chairman, uh, so, and Chad, maybe, or Chad. It's been five Jared. years, Scott. I know. You don't call Jared. Chad anymore. <laughs> Jared, I know. I'll probably, I don't know why I even call you Chad. It's all right. Chad was Ouch. the guy here before him, and they're doppelgangers, so anyway. It's all right. Um, Jared's a much nicer guy. Though. Just kidding. Chad was nice, too. Anyway, let the, let the Jared. Show. Jared. So my question is, is can we send a recommendation of approval to the city council with an exclude section 17.170.0 with design review process and the section about historical preservation? So we can send everything else yeah. and strike those two sections. And table those two sections? No, uh, no just strike. strike them, send them back to the city to say, go and figure it out and, 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 and bring those separate as another time. And because all the comments tonight were primarily around those two issues, the majority right. of them. And as, as far as the parking, the, the height requirements, all those different things, I'm, I'm very comfortable with, sure. with, with a lot of these things in there. The new purpose statement, design guidelines, a lot of those things I really like. Um, the, what you showed today in trying to make better um, graphical you know, design standards for development, I, I love all those. Right. But I would really like to, to strike Every, essentially remove those two sections from the proposal and, and not even really have the, I mean, obviously the city council can determine what they want to do because they're the, the body on that, but, but our recommendation would include striking those two sections. I would like to see a, a, a motion to that effect. So. Just so we're on board, what two sections? Which two sections? 17.170.040 design review process and then 17.170.060 historic preservation. So okay. can you explain that a little bit yeah, so more clearly? So you're not striking them, you're leaving them in from the previous. Right. Yes. Right. You're, you're striking would be sending the new the proposed. Changes. Yes. Ordinance. We would be sending a recommendation to the city council of approval for everything else mm -hmm. but those two sections. Yes. So can I, I want and make that clear to the right and not ever call him chat again well, yeah but uh, and i don't know why i do it i haven't seen him for five years i don't know why i, speaking so. I now know why he says chad the beloved yeah, yeah. apparently <laughs> that's just an idiosyncrasy that i have <laughs> among many um one thing to point out if you if you are if you are parsing out that entire section 040 it contains a lot of other changes as well including um calling things certificates of appropriateness as opposed to design review approval, and then that carries over into other sections right. that have been modified So as well. we can just state that we do not want to see the DRC, you know, removed from the, removed from the process. We want them involved in the process in some way. Right. And I personally would like to see it modified and, and streamlined so that it does not hold up projects that, right. that come before the city yeah. so I, I think we can be a little less yeah. specific perhaps okay. yeah I mean I mean I don't you know I'm fine to get rid of the whole certificate of appropriateness versus design review I mean as far as the name that doesn't bother me but I like the design review committee right. so um, if, if that's the intent then I would suggest that 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 
that removal of the design review committee as a part of the process be the thing that we remove as opposed okay, to the other as changes. A, as opposed, but, but, but then the historical preservation has to do with the list. That's, it does. And, 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 that whole section is, is different. Yeah, so. yeah, so that's fine. So, okay. So crystal clear, you can say all that in your motion. <laughs> sure. Susan, do you have any other comments? Yeah. No. All right. But so I, I like where we're going in yeah. this direction. So. I agree. Okay. Give it can, a shot. I, can I clarify for the group, if I make sure I'm understanding this right, before you start making a motions. motion? Yeah. So Scott's intended, and talking with Phil and everybody, the Scott's intent is to say, make a motion to to forward recommendation of approval for this proposed changes, with the exception that the design review committee would change, and nothing in. And you're not recommending approval of any changes in 171.70.060 historic preservation. There you go. Is that what is that the intent? Did you write that down? I, I was trying to, but I got all nervous about what he said. So, <laughs> so yes, with the exception of leaving the design review committee in place, we and, and then essentially the everything about historic preservation not, not would, changing the historic would not preservation would not change at all at this, at this, at this time. Okay. That, okay. As long as we all understand what you're saying. Okay. Is everyone on the same page? Uh, yes. I think so. I believe so. I, I agree with you. Okay. We'll wait until the minutes come out. Then we'll <laughs> eviscerate. We'll read all the minutes, and then we'll be like, oh, all right. Okay. All right. I think we're finished with this. And section. apologies to whoever transcribes the minutes. <laughs> and she's really good at never actually putting Chad in the minutes. I, it's very really nice. That's why I like her. Chad, yeah. Brad, you know, just All right. Are you finished? Um, I, I, I think I can. I, give I, it a I, shot. I think I can do it. Okay. So the reality is, is just tell Priscilla to do what you said, Chad. But I'll, I'll get really close. <laughs> so, <laughs> I. Just a second. Sure. Go ahead, Mac. <laughs> Mac Tallwood, isn't his name? Oh my goodness. I mean, a little few sidebars here, but I think we have a... Well, Brian stood up, so that's what makes me nervous. Yeah. No. Brian's He's a lawyer. Wife. We don't have to worry about him. Oh, wait, wait. Brian, do you have a we challenge flag from the NFL that you can just throw the red flag? We are, we are making a recommendation to the city just, council. It is just a recommendation. And so. it's uh, for the that. city council to take right. our recommendation I, I know, but, uh, and, we'll let them and adjust convert. the ordinance are we good uh, to as okay. they see appropriate. M Mr. Chairman... One more. Unless Bryant has something. All right, Bryant, Melinda, you have anything for the okay. commissioners? Okay, we got a lot of thumbs up. And and no, she has something the play calls a stand, except for Melinda's stepping up to the microphone. Well, d d just trying to make sure the forthcoming motion is clearly understood by all of us. So, yes, it, it, especially our legal counsel. Um, <laughs> well, he gave me a thumbs up. So it would it would essentially be if I'm understanding correctly, it would be forwarding a recommendation of approval to the city council with the exception of the changes that have been put forth in the historic preservation portion, mm -hmm. meaning leaving that as is, and then a reinstatement of the design review committee. That is correct. They're in the involvement of the design the, the review. Involvement, well, the abolishment of the design review. Well, we want them we to want be maintaining them. Yes. We want them to remain in the process. In okay. some form. In some form. So those two sections that, well, the design review committee section has essentially been removed. So the motion would include then putting those, I guess, removing the red lines, putting it back in, leaving it as is all of the above, and then the historic preservation, essentially the same. Um, yeah. There may be some red lines yeah, in I, the design review I mean, it, process it, 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 it that we keep, yeah. Yeah. But, but that the design review committee Not stays Itself in be practice. I, I mean, the, the thing I'm comfortable keeping is I'm comfortable having it say design review versus certificate of appropriateness. Okay. Like, like I'm comfortable with that. But I, I think it's a collective that we want the design review committee to stay as an active body right. in reviewing these applications. But whether you call it a certificate of appropriateness or a design review approval, it seems to me like it would be a reasonable change. Because the design review committee could still say, we give design review approval. Right. 
It's just not a certificate of appropriateness. But they're not abolished. But they're not abolished. Right. Because, so that's why the design review committee could say we'll give a design review blessing. A lot of head shaking. So yes. do I have enough thumbs yes. ups and, do and do, do you understand? Yeah. Now I'm all confused anyway, so we'll, we'll give it a shot. Yes. So Mr. Chairman, I will make a motion that the Planning Commission that we forward a recommendation of approval to the City Council for the proposed amendments to the Murray City Land Use Ordinance Section 17.170 Murray City Center District MCC, MCCD Zone with the exception of leaving the design review committee as an important part of the process, but you but comfortable with saying design review instead of certificate of appropriateness, and leaving the historical the section regarding historical preservation. Um, what? Yeah, seventeen dot one seven zero dot zero six zero. Leaving that as it was prior to any red lines. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay. I will second. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. I have a motion and a second. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Jared, could you call a roll call vote, please? Yes. 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 Thank you. So the motion passes to pass on that recommendation to the city council for their discussion and consideration. Um, I too uh, have probably only been in Murray here for 25 years, but have become uh, partial to the downtown. And, and um, I think what we've sent here to the city council has, has a little bit of legs in, in it. And uh, between now and, and the city council getting this recommendation and uh, determining what they do with it, um, they may have some additional time to review it versus just approve what we've given them, uh, which will also give all of us an opportunity to continue voicing our, our desires and opinions uh, to our city leaders. So with that, I appreciate all of you participating. I think I can say for everybody up here, um, I would love to hear from you um, all the time. Sometimes it's painful, but that's part of the process. It was so, extremely civil tonight, too, and I appreciate that greatly. And I hope we get it right as a, as a city. Well, so with that, this, this agenda item is closed, and the rest of us have one more to, to go through. If you would like to stay, we would love to have you. We'll, uh, we'll be done by 9.30, I'm sure, <laughs> um, or in about five minutes. So thank you again for participating, and um, we'll look forward to continuing the discussion. So agenda item number nine, I won't introduce a lot of it other than it's uh, changes to Murray General Plan to match Senate, Utah State Senate Bill 34, which is regarding a moderate income housing. Correct, thank you. So, and you might think this was the easiest thing I did in the last two weeks, but it, it was not actually. Uh, from the results of the, uh, of the work we did on it are pretty basic and simple, but the, um, the upshot is that there was a, a new Senate bill passed in March, Senate Bill 34, that dealt with moderate income housing. Every city um, and the counties are supposed to have a moderate income housing plan. There were several changes in SB 34 that modified how cities are allowed to have those plans and what things those plans have to do. Um, a lot of the cities have kind of ignored, well, not a lot of the cities, but some of the cities have ignored those requirements for moderate income housing over the years, and, and this is one more attempt by the state to make sure that we deal with those problems. Um, basically, at, at the end of the day, there was a laundry list of things that your general plan, first of all, that it requires that the modern income housing plan be adopted as a part of your general plan. It can't be a separate plan that's housed somewhere else. It has to be part of the general plan. We already do that. We have a modern income housing section. It's chapter nine of our general plan. So we were already ahead of the game in that instance. Transportation um, changes had to be made to our transportation plan. We looked at those things and, and met the requirements that came out in SB 34. So we're, again, we're, we're already meeting most of these requirements. Um, there's a laundry list, 24 or so 
different goals and strategies for regarding modern income housing that your, your modern income housing plan had to address and that your general plan housing elements and things had to address. You had to have at least four of those things. Um, we had on, I think I counted 18 of those things we do in our general plan, 18 of the 24. However, two of them specifically were not present in the specific part of our general plan that they're required to be. So our recommendation to make sure we're compliant with SB 34 is that uh, you recommend to the City Council that we add these two additional strategies to Chapter 9.3, Objective 1. Uh, they, there's objectives and then strategies beneath them. We need one strategy to say maintain reduced residential parking requirements in the MCCD mixed use and transit-oriented development zones. And the second strategy, implement transit-oriented development and or mixed use zoning for properties in and around transit stations. We already actually do those things. We're just supposed to state it explicitly in this okay. one single portion of our plan. Yeah, With that change, we'll be fully compliant. Um, and we won't lose any of our transportation funding opportunities in the coming year. Okay. Uh, have any questions? I know it's relatively simple at that point. No questions well, for staff. Thank you. I was happy to see this um, verbiage on here that said that they encourage um, townhomes, rural homes, and duplexes that appeal to younger and older individuals because I think that's some, something that we can really expand on. I prefer twin home to duplex, but. Sure. Those are, I think those are a valuable part of the market. You bet, and, and Marie's embraced a lot of those things. That it's, that the state is trying to make sure that other cities do that as well. Uh, I, I feel like with modern income housing, it's, it's a huge problem all over the, the Wasatch Front, but we're, we're mm -hmm. in a better position than a lot of cities. Do you have any idea how they calculate moderate income? 80, mm -hmm. Well, it goes in a range from 85% of the median income on down to um, like 35% of the median okay, so income. So you, you don't really have a number for, for Murray, what moderate Not right at the, not today, but we have a report that I have to do by December 18th, so I could tell you by then. Mm -hmm. I'd just be curious to, to know. Yeah. We have to redo it again. Median income in, in Murray, I, I think last time I checked was $52,000, roughly. So 85% of that puts you in Thanks. the range of moderate income. At Thank the top you. of it, anyway. All right. I Thank will you. open this agenda item up for public comment. I'm not too particularly, uh, my, my name is Delenn Barney. I live at 4902 South Box Elder Street. And I'm not real versed on this particular, the amendment that the state passed. But one thing that concerns me about limiting the number of parking spots is uh, when I travel between, on 48 South between the railroad tracks and Commerce Drive, there's cars parked on both sides of the street. And then just after, just before the apartment complex, there's a street that heads to the uh, north. And there's cars parked on that, uh, along with the cars that are already parked in the uh, parking spaces. That, uh, and so, if there's even less spaces than the MCC, well not, in yeah, the MCCD district, which which I live in, I'm just wondering what's going to happen around my house as far as people parking in front of my house or people parking in the uh, new proposed uh, city hall parking lot or wherever they might want to park. I'm just concerned about the influx of additional parking. Uh, years ago, I went to the LDS hospital and there are signs up there limiting where, you know, for residential parking only. And uh, I'm just waiting for the, some of the parking to spill over from the hospital into the uh, neighborhood where I live. I'm just up the street from them. So thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Other public comment? Hi, Kim Anderson, 1144 Chevy Chase Drive, Salt Lake City, Utah. And the reason it is Salt Lake City is I my post office box is Salt Lake, even though I live in Murray City. I'm in Granite School District. I don't have Murray Power. We don't have Utopia. We don't have uh, you know, so anyway, like I said, we're the ugly stepsister. Anyway, um, there are major problems in a lot of areas right now with parking. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the transit, uh, Salt Lake City's finding this out in uh, a lot of their areas where they're building their tall uh, apartment buildings. Uh, the neighborhoods are overrun with parking. I heard on the radio on KUER about a week ago where some girl had to drive around the neighborhood six times to try to find a parking place. And then when she finally found a parking place, she was accosted on the way back to her apartment. So, uh, in, you know, maybe we'll get there as a society to leave our car home. 
But if I were to take my car to work right now, it would take me about two and a half hours to get there by bus and train. Or, or well, I could ride, but I'm not well. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Other public comment? Seeing none, I'll close the public comment period and ask Jared, can you answer the uh, parking question? Will, will this really re um, reduce the parking availability to residents? I can't say that it wouldn't. It, there's always that possibility, but this is, I, I would say this, this is a, an amendment to our general plan supporting something that we're already doing in our mixed use zones and our transit oriented development zone and in our MCCD. Um, and we don't have the same kind of, in Salt Lake City and certain districts, they're not requiring parking at all for, for any kind of development. We're not proposing that kind of thing. We're simply trying to comply with the state's mandate that in order for us to, to receive more transportation funds, state that we want to preserve these goals. It, it really won't affect our current practice. It reflects our current practice. And mm -hmm. we haven't seen enough of the development borne out to say whether that creates huge problems or not. Although I will say that in, for example, in the TOD zone in the, um, in the fire clay area, we have some parking problems west of the tracks. But the newer developments that we've done under about this parking standard, maybe a little bit less, are not creating parking problems. At the metro buildings, we have three and 400 units in there. And not we're not seeing parking problems. I drive through there all the time just to kind of monitor it. And there's not really any times when I couldn't find an on-street parking space somewhere. Um, we should be OK. All right. Other discussion? Just simply, I mean, it sounds like we're, we're doing this for the right reason, you know, obviously. And, and I think that's great. I mean, I share the concern that, you know, Mr. Anderson said is, is uh, there's so much of, and we talked about this. Remember, we walked, Phil, a few years ago, we walked around Fire Clay. Mm -hmm. And we talked about some development there. And I made the comment there. I'm like, so much of this transit-oriented development is cultural, and we're fighting a cultural battle. We, you know, and until we have more people willing to to not have as many cars. One of my sales reps lives in Chicago and doesn't own a car, he lives downtown. But he can get everything he needs downtown. And and he can every I mean shopping, entertainment, everything he needs, he can get without having a car. We're not at that spot in, in general in, in, in Salt Lake. I and in Utah. I love that we're having principles and our, our general plan that drives us in that direction and I appreciate the efforts of staff especially in what we just talked about in the last issue of upping the parking standards in the MCCD to make sure that we understand that balance so I really appreciate the work of staff and the vision and it is a difficult issue that I think all of us would like to see it would be awesome to have a, a very walkable downtown with all those businesses and shop fronts full of stores and, and the different things to be able to do what you need to live downtown. But we're not there yet. And as much of it's cultural as it is, you know. But um, anyway, so I just applaud the this, this staff for doing this. I think it's wonderful. And I'm very, very supportive of it. So. I, I would like to point out that part of the original problems in that, that uh, transit district were caused by a developer that that misused the standards. One of the initial buildings that were yep. built um, was not in compliance, and no one that is here today was involved with enforcing that. So I'm not blaming anyone here, but there were issues uh, created that caused a lot of those early problems, and I think that staff uh, uh, and the city officials have done an excellent job with future development because there aren't nearly the problems yeah. that there were and it's taken a long time to try and correct those additional those those early original problems but i think we're doing a good job good job jared and zach melinda good job so and i would reiterate that murray city while we're going to add these two statements into the general plan um, doesn't have to take any action to meet all the requirements for the um, Senate Bill 34. Um, and as Jared said, the, um, the general plan doesn't change at all. All of the parking requirements are still the same. Um, but it's, it's another good faith effort, I think, by Murray City, which is seen across the uh, county and the state as, as a model city. Um, uh, to put these two clauses in is is a good faith effort to follow the um, follow the law. Yep. 
So, okay. Amen. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a, uh, make a motion that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of approval to the City Council for the proposed amendments to the 2017 Murray City General Plan as presented to us in this, uh, this item. All right, I have a motion. Is there a second? I'd like to second the motion. The second. Other discussion? So, Jared, could you call a roll call vote again? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Woodbury? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Hacker? Yes. So, motion passes, and again, uh, the commission will pass a recommendation to uh, the Murray City Council for their consideration. All right, is there other business from the staff? Just um, real quickly as a reminder, we have the um, Planning Commission training next week annually. Uh, we're gonna leave a big portion of that open for you guys to ask questions and have discussions and I imagine there'll be, I can't imagine there'll be anything on your mind about anything that we do. Tiny homes and bees. That's. There you go. Just so we're going to leave some of it open, but we will have a few things that we need to talk about. Um, one of them it, we've mentioned before, there, there's been some staff items that have come up that we wanted to talk to you more about, the, the kinds of things you find valuable in the staff reports if we want to make changes. Yep. Zach won't be able to join us um, that evening, but Susan and Melinda, I, Melinda, you're going to be out of town too, right? Or are you going to be there that night? Okay, I, I will be there. okay so Melinda and Susan and I will be there. and. Uh, there you go. So if you have any specific questions that you'd like us to answer before that meeting, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm trying to put together an agenda right now. So. And that's 6 o'clock over at the city office? The city, at the city. We'll, we'll feed you. We've got food coming in. So. In that conference room that we always do it Public in. Works. Yeah. Okay. Right down in the Public Works building. Awesome. Yep. I have a question about that, sure. Jared. So um, I know you have to be careful when you have all elected officials or us as being appointed officials in a room to make policy and that sort of thing. Right. But... So a few things that we talked about this evening, one of them was, you know, an, a weekly newsletter, right. keeping the residents informed. Are those things that we can talk about, discuss? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it'll be posted as an open meeting. It, okay. We won't be taking comments from anyone. Yep. But if anyone and not that we're going to make any policy, but right. that we can discuss well, them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, but talking about those kind of things for transmission, sure, <clears throat> we can talk about that. We'll make it Excellent. If citizens come, do they get dinner? You no. know, we don't plan for that. Oh, but you never know. <laughs> or budget. I so don't your have kids can't so come. Uh, I'm sorry. I was thinking yeah, your kids, yeah, five kids. Your kids cannot yeah. come. Uh, that, that's all right. what we have from staff. Well, do any commissioners have a motion to adjourn for the council? We have a motion. I have a second. Second. All right. All right. Motion to the second. Adjourn. Any nays? Oh. All right. Motion passes, and this <laughs> meeting is completed. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Lisa.